Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, welcome. Um, just introduce. I'll just briefly introduce, and then I'll let you get into it, Anne, because I know we're short of time. So, um, everybody, this is Anne Murchison. Um, Anne is in a school, rural school in Western Victoria. A few people are asking where about in Western Victoria, Anne. Ah, oh, okay. So I teach in a small school. It's between Warrnambool and Hamilton. So do you know where Warrnambool is? Sort of on the end of the Great Ocean Road. So we're in the Western District. Uh, so Warrnambool is 40 minutes away. Hamilton is about 50 minutes. So we're very much in a rural area. Uh, we, I'll, I'll show you some slides in a minute that show you a little bit more about the school. Now, Anne is a, a guru of technology, an absolute master of partnerships and collaboration. We're quite privileged to have Anne um, Skyping in today. Um, so I'm sure you're going to be amazed with some of the stuff that Anne does. So um, we are recording this as well. So we'll, anybody who's not here will be able to put it up and show other people as well. Um, and also Anne has set up a back channel for questions. Now, I'm going to ask you all during the um, session today to think about a question that you might want to ask Anne. So from what Anne's talking about, think about a question. And then if there's time at the end, we can ask some, but if there's no time, which I suspect there won't be, then we can use the back channel that Anne has set up and we'll put that onto the LMS. So over to you, Anne. Okay, so first of all, I've got a Windows update on my machine. My headset is not working, so it's all open. So you're going to hear our school bell go, you're going to hear the students come in at some stage. So I do apologise for any background noise. So first of all, um, I'm going to share my screen with you. So uh, let me see, I've got to pull up the PowerPoint instead. Can you tell me, can you actually see the PowerPoint clearly? Yes, we can, yeah. So it's coming through fairly quickly. Well, I called this presentation the connected classroom because technology, I wish I was young like you guys and starting my teaching uh, profession because technology is just opening up some amazing ways of connecting and learning beyond our classroom walls. So, you know, you will no longer be teaching solo, I'm sure. Uh, if, you will, if you're happy to be, take the risks, you can be connected and learn so much with you, your class and others around the world, Victoria or Australia. So these are a few pictures of our school. It's prep to year 12. Uh, we have 220 students. Our town is 150 residents. So most of our students live on farms, get bus to school or live in really small country towns. So if you see the school sign there, we teach Mandarin Chinese as our second language. Uh, we don't really have mobile phone service at our school. Um, so we are maybe handicapped, maybe that's why we pushed innovation a little bit further because we can't get our devices to work except with Wi-Fi. But you people are probably more expert at technology and social networking than I am. But I'm fascinated by some of these mobile apps that we have access to now. And I have a son who used to live in South Africa, a son who lives in London, and another one who's working in New York. So we can stay connected. It feels like there is no barriers, um, no restrictions between us, because we can use video conferencing, messaging, etc., to stay up to date in real and non-real time. Because of this, our learning spaces are changing very much. They're going digital, mobile, virtual, and what I love, global. So, connected classrooms involve us connecting perhaps with other teachers. Um, I think when you start teaching, it's really important to have mentors, people you can ask questions of, get help from whenever you need. Our students can be connected. Uh, we can connect to our state, our community, nationally and of course globally and all the time we want to drive that or encourage that curiosity that students might have and allow it to be the questions that they might have to be answered if we can create together collaborate via connections that learning becomes a lot richer but when we use technology there are things that we need to be aware of um, when we do interact with other cultures, we've got religious differences. We need to be transparent. Um, 
images, you know, copyright, appropriate behaviour, set up some codes of conduct, etc. And when you do go globally, I find language can be a barrier for us because our school very much speaks English, we're white, Caucasian, and I learnt French at school, but I don't remember much. So, if you're going to teach in a school next year, or when do you guys actually graduate? Another three weeks. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, things could have changed by then too. But if you go into a Victorian government school, just remember some of these things. You'll be allowed to get access to a virtual classroom through our Department of Education license. And I think that's whether you're in a government school or a non-government school. So that means you can connect your classroom, you know, your students within each other in a virtual setting, or you can actually connect your classroom with another one in Victoria, um, in Australia or the world. And each student can be logged on. So they've all got access to the chat. Um, they've got their own, you know, they feel like they're personally connected because they're on their own screen and device. But what I love is that it has got that chat, the capacity to record, send files. It becomes an interactive whiteboard on these screens. You can poll, video conference, and you can split people up into groups. Why would we do that? First of all, students do become ill. And if we can record our classroom, or if we can bring them in from hospital, or from their home, wherever they are um, trying to recover, then they are not going to miss out on so much schoolwork. They still feel connected. They've got a, a line for you to be able to um, respond to, answer questions of things they might be struggling with. This is an example of a back channel. I hope it's clear enough for you to read the writing, is it? Yeah. So we had a lecturer in Mount Gambier, South Australia, talking to us about our volcanic region and he talked about the animals that live in our region and he talked first about the bats. Now we had students um, from four different schools around Victoria uh, virtually connected with us and some were from grade two, three, we had grade five, six, I think I had year eight students in there as well. So some were logged on as a class and some were logged on individually and of course younger students take a lot longer to type. So by the time he moved on from bats, he went on to the fish that live in the lakes. These questions all popped up in the bat channel. So he stopped, he, um, he, he talked to their curiosity, answered their questions, and he had to come back for another session to finish his presentation on the other animals. So while we're teaching others, we can have all these questions in our head that often get lost and only your confident students might put their hands up and stop you and ask you, you know, what their curiosity is all about. These are some of the amazing connections that you can make. This is a photo that shows students connected to um, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra members. So we are three and a half hours from Melbourne. Students are not exposed to the arts very much. It's too much effort, cost, distance to get them there. So if we can bring in experts virtually, our students don't miss out. So all our students were logged on individually. We'd have a different symphony member um, each week, over six weeks. They'd play their instrument to the students. Students in the back channel could ask their questions um, and then they would respond. And our students actually told them if they liked what they heard, what they thought would be better, um, you know, perhaps a different tune for them, etc. And I think when the orchestra play to an audience, they don't get that feedback. They either get applause or silence. But here the students are actually chatting in that back channel and giving them real detail. You can do things like when kids come uh, for parade days at school, like favourite book character, Easter hat parade, they love to parade to an audience. So we sometimes do that virtually. So the students will come up to the web camera, show their costume or their hats or whatever they've made, talk about it, and then our students will um, give them feedback or ask questions on their gear. This is just to show that when you're in a virtual classroom and each student's logged on, they can all draw on the whiteboard at once, the virtual whiteboard. So we had about 50 students all on at once 
and they tried to draw and decorate an Easter egg. This probably got a bit messy because there are probably too many students on there at once. But it just goes to show they can all be busy, engaged all the time in that classroom. And this just shows you the extent of the global connections we have this day. Uh, there were students from the USA, a teacher from the USA, a lecturer from Japan, a parent from Japan, a student from Japan, my students in Australia, and, my, and parents of mine in Australia all linked up virtually, either from their homes, their schools, etc. And my students have, have developed presentations and we're sharing what it's like to live in our rural area. And this is the feedback that we get from students because you might think, what do they think about it all? But I think it's really important to get their feedback, their evaluation, etc. And we have a blog. Each student in our school has a blog in the secondary area. Oh, are you people going to teach primary or secondary? So there's a mixture and so early childhood and primary is the course that the students are on. So some may teach primary, some may teach early childhood. Okay, so some of my examples are secondary, but I've taught primary right through from prep to year 12. So I think I've got some samples for each. And I'm sure you could adapt it to your students anyway. But when you do um, get employment as a teacher, our education department offer lots and lots of virtual classrooms. So they bring in the cyber safety people. Now these are probably directed at grade four, five, six, and they talk about issues being safe online. They run about four or five sessions a year. And you can just register for these, bring your class in on the interactive whiteboard or a whiteboard or whatever. And you can actually hear from the experts. They do really engaging uh, materials with the students too and make it very interactive. But this just shows you in that one virtual classroom, uh, we were using Blackboard Collaborate then, but the license now is for Adobe Connect. There were actually 17,000 students as part of that class. Um, we even had a class of deaf students, so they had a sign language interpreter in their room, but there was really only that one teacher or presenter. So that's the amazing you know, way that our technology is taking us. And this is just a sample of their presentation, so you know the presenter would ask the classes questions and it was up to the teacher in the physical classroom to make sure that was um, followed. We also have the opportunity now, if you teach in a country high school or secondary school that's got more, uh, any country high school, any primary school with less than 100 students and some other secondary schools, they've been given polycom video conferencing equipment so it's quite a large high definition video conferencing that you can almost dial another school within the system immediately by selecting it from the channel. But that means we can bring in experts again virtually. So that was Miss Delightful. She was actually in Sydney and it was um, literacy or book week. So she was teaching the students how to think about literacy through pottery. So our primary school teachers, oh sorry, students don't really have specialist teachers in art all the time. So this was a wonderful opportunity for our students to learn um, ceramic skills. So they created little clay marks of their favourite book characters. Um, this was their, probably their first Zoom cup and they thought they were watching television. Then all of a sudden they realised she was asking them questions and interacting and making them interact. Oh, so I don't know if you can see the clay marks there. We then fired them, they all represented a book character, etc. She told us what materials we had to have. I think they were with her for about two hours. They wrote evaluations and blog posts, so she was able to see their final product. Anzac Day is celebrated um, in our school, and we found that we could actually link up with Mark Wilson, who's an artist, and he's drawn the um, drawings for, oh, what's her name? Um, French, Becky French is it? Her books. Anyway, he came in via that video conferencing equipment Polycom and he showed the students how to sketch. He actually used a mix of an interactive whiteboard where we had to log on so we could see his drawing on there. The students, you can see the engagement in the students there. I think these are grade three and four. And then there's the result of the students' work. 
So again, you don't have to be the expert. You can bring experts in. These were free of charge. Um, so there's just sites you need to join to be able to know when they're available. I'll quickly go through um, some of the things the secondary students have done. But in Canberra, they had a forum with the politicians before the last elections. So the school in Canberra were online and we came in virtually um, through video conferencing equipment. They set up a Twitter or a back channel. So our students were able to interact. The politicians actually had their devices and if they weren't speaking to the students, they actually got it um, active in the chat too and looked for their questions in there. Each student could ask one question. Um, so Georgia was our student. She asked the politician her question, which is, how are they going to help subsidise the cost of country students going to Melbourne to study? But of course, these students up here had devices and they were saying, well, it costs us a lot of money too. Why can't they help us? So it was a very active um, chat. And the Twitter fall, they had a hashtag to follow. That was Georgia's question. But this is back to experts like the National Gallery of Victoria. They are willing to provide um, lessons for your students. I don't know if they're um, charging a small cost now, but last year was very much an experimental year. So we had these wonderful education teachers from the National Gallery of Victoria showing our students some of their artifacts, some of their displays, photographs, etc., which again, our students don't, don't get to Melbourne to see. But not only that, they had activities that they would get the students to do. So you can see this is one of the students showing her work in progress. She got evaluation from the teacher down at the National Gallery of Victoria, and she went back and improved her work, etc. So you can see this is my computer lab. The students are hard at work um, completing the tasks that they were supposed to do. So students are learning new skills altogether now how to use a web camera effectively, communication, you know, um, speech craft, clear diction. We're learning how to manipulate the camera so the art gallery teachers could actually see students' individual work while they were working. Because with this equipment, you can zoom in, zoom out. And this one is with grade twos and year nine and 10. So we've got mixed age groups all in the one room. And the lady in the screen is Wisteria, and she's from America. So some of the museums in America offer free sessions um, for you to connect your classrooms with. And she talked about um, the, some of the artifacts. She actually showed them things they had in the museum. She had pictures going on behind her. And she engaged both those grade twos and those older students for nearly an hour. And what did the students like about it? Um, some of the things she talked about were like the northern lights. So that gave us an opportunity to say to the students, well, what lights do we see, etc. But they like learning from a person rather than through a textbook. This makes our textbook come completely to life. Um, this is an example of Year 9, 10 students using Skype, because we find that Skype um, is a really easy tool to use, it's free, and you can see how we're using it today. And these students, my year 19 students, practiced reading a book to a web camera, first of all. They found a book that was suitable for Prep 1 students, and then on World Read Aloud Day, each pair of students read their book, showed the photographs, to students who were on a remote cattle station in Catherine. Are there any questions while I'm saying all this? Does anyone want to ask a question? Shall I keep going? If you think of them, stop me. Um, this is just to show that this is night time for me because it's Russian daytime. So these teachers are from Russia. The students are from a special school and they don't come to school every day because of their either intellectual or physical disabilities. But this day was um, International Peace Day. So the students came to school who could, but those who were physically disabled and couldn't even get to school came in on the laptop screen of their teacher or aide. So they projected the web camera so they could still see me on the large screen 
in the Russian classroom. And they were able to actually ask questions. So, you know, no, no student will be handicapped if we use technology effectively. This is a grade six student in Boston. I, I am not highly skilled in technology really, but I'm well networked. So it doesn't matter if I don't know how to do something, I've got a contact that either knows how to or can put me onto someone else that does. So our students are gonna use Scratch and Scratch is fantastic. There's a little um, junior version now for the younger students too, like prep one twos, but it's programming or coding with um, like jigsaw type blocks. So Lana from Boston, USA, from her home with her parents with her and her teacher, we use three video cameras all linked up on Skype. My students were in the library and Lana taught them how to use Scratch because they had to make this, oh, sorry, let me go back. They had to make a little sprite. They had to introduce themselves with a speech alone. And then it went on this amazing global world museum site. So my students remembered what Lana said. And if they didn't remember, some in the class did. So between the students, they built their little sprite. So each one created a sprite, made a speech bubble, introduced themselves. And then as they went on the world museum site online, when they bumped into students from other countries, that would come their speech bubble. So this professor in Japan, who is very clever, put it all together and we could see Russian responses, um, USA, uh, Japan, you know, lots of different languages happening. So my students are encouraged to write a blog post. So he can see this was Kaylin's blog post in relation to uh, Lana's teaching. Did she like learning from her? Yes, because it's fun to learn with someone that's from a different country. Lana was a really good teacher and she was only grade six. Um, this is also to show you what mobile devices will do now. I couldn't solve the older students' problems that they were facing in Scratch. So my friend Lorraine, who is the teacher of Lana in Boston, was online in Skype. So I said, Lorraine, could you please help my students? So we got Lorraine on Skype on an iPad. The students would introduce themselves with a forward camera. Then they would use the reverse camera to show her their coding and what they wanted to do. When she helped them solve their problem, she got passed around to the next student. I think this is a really um, interesting comment from one of mine. You can't ask questions of a textbook, but you can of people. I'll just go through very quickly. I got asked for a, a picture via, in, from, via a Skype group that I'm in, for a picture of our lunch, typical lunch boxes, because students in Germany were studying healthy foods as part of science. Lucky it was nearly lunch time in our school, so we quickly took two photos of uh, two different lunch boxes. We emailed them back to Germany, and the teacher in Germany thanked me and then looked at my blog. And he could see that we were a rural school, uh, that we had a vegetable garden, etc. And another class was looking at water and issues and challenges of water in Germany. So my year eight students then made a podcast about issues with all water in our rural areas. We have a veggie garden. So he asked me if I could teach his students in Germany, and I use Skype for this, about our vegetable garden at school and how we use it in our canteen. Now, when we talked about the canteen, he said to me, Anne, do you think we could do an Australian food day in Germany? And you do. And I thought, wow, why not we do a German food day in our canteen? So we had to link up the two canteen managers, but the German lady didn't speak English. We don't speak German. So one of the teachers was our interpreter. He had the year seven German class that were learning English on board. We showed the different foods we have in our canteen, talked about the differences, and then the managers decided which recipes they would use for that day. We were not allowed to use abbreviations. We had to email our recipes to uh, the German teacher who gave it to that class to interpret, and it was a great success. So the German students decorated their canteen with all sorts of Australiana. Uh, this was our menu and we sold out within 10 or 15 minutes. So this year our canteen manager would like to do another country's food day. 
because all the time, food's a common language in a way. We're learning about other countries and cultures. And then just to show the amazing things that can be done, students in Germany joined a Google Hangout. So this is another video conferencing connecting tool through Google. They presented on their drinking water on, and the German islands. And in the next slide, so I, there are about four other teachers around the world listening to them. Oh, I haven't got the photo. But then we, they did the Mardi Gras costumes and we could judge them. So we had a Google spreadsheet that was collaborative. So immediately we could give them a score out of 10. And then when they all finished showing us their costumes, they could actually see in real time who had won. And the teachers were from Africa, Nepal, Australia and Indonesia. Some of the amazing projects you can get involved in with your students. They are ongoing, they are a little trickier, but there's a fantastic K2 Building Bridges project, which is organised by Julie Lindsay. Um, these are for my older students though, so they get mixed in groups of students around the world. They don't work with students in their physical classroom. Um, they socialise on a ning. They actually work on topics from the Horizon Report, which is K to 12. So one of these topics is theirs. Um, they build a web page on their, uh, what they found in their research, etc. And finally, they make a little movie. And that's really pushing technology to the great um, extent and in innovative ways where education can lead. You know, Australian Bells now, engagement with Asia is one of the priorities in many of our learning areas. So I find that mobile devices and mobile apps are making amazing progress for us here. But these three girls, uh, first of all, are coming in at lunchtime to work with students in Indonesia and they're using the chat a lot, text chat, because the Indonesian students speak English as their third or fourth language. So they're just making sure they understand. Now the students were demonstrating a cooking um, class or a recipe, but they didn't know what the English word was for this uh, vegetable. And my girls um, guessed and guessed and guessed, and finally they realised it was bean shoots. So the Indonesian students would straight away say the word several times with my girls saying yes, they've got it right or not. These are younger students in Thailand on the right. This is the professor from Japan who does the amazing scratch projects. And uh, some of my students in my class, grade four, five and six there. The students in Thailand were playing musical instruments for them. And then they showed their scratch projects. So straight away we see different languages. We're looking at a different religion for my students, remember, because we very much like Caucasian. So we've been completely immersed in a different culture. Um, the bandwidth was great. We could see the Scratch Project video going really well. Uh, this is Book Parade Week. Uh, book Week, sorry, the kids came dressed in book characters. We linked up with a class in Taiwan. They had to guess what book character they were. And amazingly, they'd read a lot of the books that um, my students had. This is um, a group of students in Indonesia. Now these are only prep grade one, the ones from Indonesia, the ones with the more English names are Australian. And all we did was set up a back channel and had Skype webcam on our classrooms. So each class would take a turn to ask students a question, like what's your favourite food? And the groups of students who were logged on individually would answer back in that back channel. But we're starting to le learn etiquette, appropriate conduct, etc. Mystery Skype is one of my favourite connections. So students don't know who they're connecting with. They have to work out by a series of questions, yes or no, um, you know, where those students are from. Are they from Victoria, Australia, or are they from the world? And this site up here, I don't know where you can see me, but if you join that, that's an amazing site of people around the world that want to connect actively with other classes elsewhere. Some of them have got projects that are simple to join into. Oops, let me go. My click is not working. So these are some of the questions that the students ask. They can only have a yes, no answer. And this was Dave. He was actually from the USA. And it took my 19 students 
nearly 40 minutes to work out where he was from. So they learnt to fine tune their questions and I got the students to write up reflections. What worked well, what were the challenges? I'll send you this presentation later so that you can have a look at this in more detail. But Sean was in the class and he loves American history and we don't do a lot of American history at our school. So he sat down one-on-one -on -one and asked Dave all the questions that he had and got more detail about the things he wanted to learn from Dave. Uh, just quickly, this is a mystery Skype session, first of all with a lecturer in Japan and the students were rather amazed to find that they didn't have a lot of obvious technology in their classroom because they were from a rural area as well. And they also found out they only had rice in their canteen. Um, but we were to link up with the actual class two weeks later. So I quickly got my students to tell me what they knew about Japan. And I was rather, three things they knew. And I was horrified to see some of the responses were not that you read one thing I don't know they couldn't even get the third item so we linked up but it was Christmas time so we thought it'd be much better to show them things like the Christmas tree the Santa suit etc the girls actually had a Kris Kringle organized that day without deliberately doing it so we decided to open up the presents so one of the girls disappeared dressed up in that Santa suit and pretended to be Sandra and they opened up their presents and showed what they opened. This is, um, the staff had a Christmas morning tea. This all just happened. We didn't organise this bit. So she showed the Christmas fruit cake, the little puddings, all the things we had. But this is their curiosity. Some of the students were masked and we could see that over Skype. And we didn't know if it was politically correct to ask, you know, why are you wearing masks? But the curiosity got my kids in there and they just asked them and some of the students had a blanket. So we asked them and they were quite, again, they had to learn the English because he didn't know what a cold was. So he was trying to say, we wear masks so we don't catch colds. So he learnt the word English for cold because we had to wait for the Japanese interpretation. And the girls have blankets because they don't have heating, uh, strong heating in their rooms and it was cold and I don't think it was snowing, but it was cold. Um, so that's just showing the boy answering that question on the girls, you know, why are they wearing masks? But after that, I asked the students three things they actually learnt. So now we've got more the personalities, the way the people that are living in Japan, etc. So if we can connect like this, I'm sure we can start to become empathy, develop empathy with other cultures and countries, understand a little bit more about what they're about and hopefully we can reduce the conflict. Uh, we've done things like share our breakfast. So this is the Taiwanese breakfast, um, all the different dumplings, it looks so yummy. We showed our Vegemite, um, the cow's milk that we have, etc. Now, sometimes if we don't understand each other, we hold up signs to the web camera. So this was, I think that's Mandarin Chinese. They actually put their signage up in their language. Global days are great. So you'll find there's lots of little projects happening around the world. So if you're on Twitter or if you've joined other networking groups, there's lots of people having just easy activities for you to do on those days. Um, there's also International Peace Day, etc. I've put students on collaborative Google documents in real time. So students in Malaysia and my class are actually on the same document at once answering questions in mixed smaller groups. But look at some of the amazing answers. We don't really celebrate International Friendship Day, but in Malaysia they do because they've got multicultures uh, like the Malay, the Chinese, the, um, the English, British type people, etc. And there has been conflict. So I think that's an outstanding answer from one of the boys in Malaysia. Uh, and because it was also the time when they, the Malaysian airplane went down, we actually were on Skype and we all just went silent for the minute when the people in Malaysia celebrated the minute silence. We did too. We set up Padlet, that's a fantastic tool to use to interact and collaborate in non-real time, like a sticky wall. Um, so there's, we have a student blog each. Uh, we do, if it's not real time, you can send video messages in Skype and the other class or school can see them when, they're, when we're asleep and they're in um, 
day school. This is Aunt Sagar and this is free. These are great even for your little ones. Um, the teacher just sets it up. It's like a sticky wall. Students just type in their answers up here and the more same responses you get, the larger the words become. Uh, so these are some of the global apps we use. China, WeChat works well. Uh, a lot of the other tools that we use are blocked there. I like Viber for family. WhatsApp's used very much by South Africa and America and others. Um, that's just a list of some of the favourite tools I use with mobile apps. So this is an example of Padlet. So it's not video conferencing there. We've just set up a wall. Students just got to double click on the wall. They can add a photo, comments. Um, uh, they can actually do a web camera, a video, a small video, etc. to share on some topic that you decide to set up. Uh, VoiceThread is a fantastic tool. It's like online podcasting. You can have uh, little videos going. It can be just an image. You can just talk. You can actually just text chat. But you can share the link with another school, another class around the world, and they can actually put their answers on there as well. In Victoria, the department subscribed to a campus called Global 2. So you as a teacher can get that for your own blog. It's EduBlogs uh, Campus and students can actually get their own blog. I do suggest you join Skype in the classroom because that's where you will find lots of teachers, lots of pre projects, lessons, experts. Um, challenges, time zones, bandwidth, confidence of the teachers you work with, access to technology. But some of the most connected teachers I know have one laptop and they're in the big slums of Africa, they're in small rural um, disadvantage in Nepal, etc. So anyone can do it if they've got a passion and a need. Again, we use signage a lot because Asia's in our time, America and Europe aren't, so the English speaking countries are a bit hard to connect with. In the future, I think you guys are going to have to learn to teach with and through interpreters at times. We have to learn a whole new way of communicating either in non-time um, language, you know, use uh, images, use all sorts of things to betray what we mean to do, and mobile apps. Um, on that, I've shared a document with you now, and on there you'll find a lot of um, resources and places to join. Um, subscribe to some of those blogs that our department set up, because they're, they're sharing with you what's happening all the time. So for you guys, I think it's really, really important to try and read others' blogs, join Twitter, follow hashtags like EdChat, Global Classroom. And if you follow the hashtag, you'll see all these amazing teachers and what they're sharing. Um, these are some of the places where I found my connection. So even through YouTube, even through SlideShare, some place that you don't think you'd meet people, they're out there looking for others to connect with, ask questions of, etc. And if you ever want to connect with me further, I'll give Mick my details. And, you know, please feel free to connect whenever you like. Every Tuesday, mostly during school term, there's a free online webinar where sometimes I have guest presenters, sometimes we're just discussing questions. Um, like last night we did the Connected Educator, how can we connect, what do we need to know? And that's free for you just to join. So if you've got spare time, we often have people from USA in that one and other countries as well as around Australia. They're also recorded. So that talktuesdays.global2.vic.edu.au has a link up the top that says recordings. I think we've lost the Blackboard Collaborate ones, but if you go for the last few weeks, the Adobe Connect ones are still there. So are there any quick questions, Mick? Because I, I have got year eight technology. <laughs> We will formulate some questions and we'll put them on the back channel um, and, and, and obviously that will allow you to, to get away back to your year 8 class as well. Um, we wouldn't want to um, you to have less time with them because I'm sure it's valuable for them. It's been absolutely fantastic for us and this is, um, hopefully this is now recorded because this is going to be gold dust for us. Um, you say you're not a technology expert, but um, you, you're an absolute expert in technology. 
maybe it's through exploration, I don't know, but um, you know, what you do is absolutely amazing. And thank you very much for, for talking to us today because it's been brilliant. Uh, all the best to you teacher students. I think you're going to such an exciting area. You know, textbooks are going to be a thing of the past soon. It will be digital and that real life uh, connectivity and interaction. So all the best with your studies. This has been a Swinburne production.